Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about nanotechnology. Um, that can be a potentially dense subject, but also uh, potentially ex all encompassing extremely important. The National Nanotechnology Initiative envisions a future in which the ability to understand and control matter at a nanoscale leads to revolution in technology and industry. Specifically, that has great implications for healthcare. Uh, we have uh, two excellent scientists who are going to be telling us about their work, the implications for, for human health and nanotechnology. Uh, we're going to start by having two roughly 10-minute presentations, kind of laying the groundwork of what everyone needs to know to understand this discussion and what uh, each of their particular research has been uh, based around. So we have Elizabeth Nance and Rowan Fernandez, and Rowan is going to go first. He is with the Bio Bioengineering Initiative at Children's National Health System. Uh, he did his postdoc at Hopkins, and I'll give you the floor, Rowan. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to stand because I can engage you a lot better by, from up here. Uh, so many of you have uh, attended the sessions on breakthroughs in cancer, the interface of biology and electronics, precision medicine. And in all of those sessions, the word nano was thrown out a lot of times. You know, nano this, nano that. So I thought it would be good for us to put things into perspective with a short presentation. I'm going to focus my talk based on the work I do, because it gives you some perspective of where we're applying nanotechnology and nanomedicine. And then Elizabeth's going to go after me, and she's going to talk a little bit about the background, the history of uh, nanotechnology and nanomedicine. So I'm working on in, with Prussian blue nanoparticles, and we're using them for imaging and therapy. Sorry about that. I've seen most of the presentation now. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you have seen this iconic painting by Hokusai of the great wave of Kanagawa. And we'll be wondering, what in the world does this have to do with nanomedicine, human health? Turns out that Hokusai, when he was making this painting, used this dye, Prussian blue, liberally to make this iconic painting. And many years later, we found out that this dye is comprised of nanoparticles. Now note, not all dyes are made up of nanoparticles. Prussian blue dye is made up of nanoparticles. And we found that these nanoparticles have very interesting properties that we could engineer for both imaging and therapy applications. So I thought it'd be prudent to give you a description of what we are talking about when we are referring to nanoparticles. So as you go from the size of an ant, which is pretty tiny, to the width of human hair, to the cells of your bloodstream, right to the DNA that make up your genetic code, nanoparticles factor in somewhere between the size of your blood cells and the DNA. So that's, they're very, very tiny. And to give you some perspective, we're going to be using these particles for imaging and therapy. So many of you must be wondering, OK, we just hear about nanotechnology, nanoparticles. It has nothing to do with us in everyday life. But it turns out there are many everyday uses of nanotechnology and nanoparticles. For example, when you try and uh, you know, use cloth whitening agents, they contain nanoparticles so that they give you a semblance of the clothes being cleaner or brighter. Another application of nanoparticles is in sunblock lotion, where you apply this to your skin. And these titanium dioxide nanoparticles protect your skin from attack from the UV rays of the sun. So these are some of the everyday applications of nanoparticles. So why are we interested about in nanoparticles for medicine? You'll appreciate that our nanoparticles are really tiny, so they can easily penetrate all the body barriers. The smallest blood vessel, the smallest capillary, is really big when you compare it to the size of the nanoparticles. The other useful property of nanoparticles is that you can make them imageable. So what that does is it allows you to see things better. Now, in a clinical context, this allows you to see a disease better and then make a more precise diagnosis so that you can come up with a more effective treatment plan. Another thing that you use nanoparticles for is that they can be used themselves as therapy agents, and I'm going to describe that. You can also attach drugs onto the nanoparticles so that when they're injected inside the body, they can take these drugs very locally and deliver them 
to the disease side, so you can uh, affect better treatments with lesser side effects. So nanoparticles allow you to see things better, allow you to treat diseases better, and this enhances the experience for a physician to come up with a better outcome for a patient. So why are we interested in Prussian blue nanoparticles? You know, when you go out there and you hear about nanotechnology, there are different platforms, and all these platforms have their own capabilities. Well, our Prussian blue nanoparticles, why we're very interested in them is because they're safe for human use. Previously, at the height of the Cold War, these nanoparticles could be ingested, and they would take away radioactive poisoning from your gastrointestinal tract. The side effect was you would poop and pee blue, but you'd be free of radiation. <laughs> the, the other component is that we have the ability to biodegrade these nanoparticles. A big concern in the field is like, if I'm going to do repeated injections, or in the case of treating a, a, a child, where the treatment course may have implications over their entire life, you want to make sure that the treatment that you're giving does what it's supposed to do, and then it goes away. So engineering biodegradable particles is very useful, and Prussian blue nanoparticles can biodegrade. A third component is that you can make these nanoparticles at very cheap and low cost of synthesis. This is very important when you're trying to like, outsource this technology to a resource-limited setting. All you need is two components. You mix it together, boom, you have the nanoparticles. For God's sake, this was made in the early 18th century, and so it's an easy technology. We have the ability now also to engineer the nanoparticles for imaging and therapy applications. I'm going to give you just a flavor of it so that I don't want to inundate you with too much of experimental and technical detail, but should give you a flavor of what these capabilities of nanoparticles and nanotechnology are that we can build upon for human health. So how do we use our nanoparticles for imaging? One big thing is using it to paint disease tissue. Wouldn't it be awesome if you went in and there was like a disease tissue that you could see precisely where the disease tissue is, where the disease begins and it ends, where normal tissue starts and it ends? In the cases of cancer, for example, and if you're doing it in a very sensitive area like in the brain, you want to ensure that you take off all of the cancer. You don't leave any residual cancer behind. But since you're working in the brain, you don't want to take out too much of the healthy tissue because it can be debilitating and you can have loss of function. So painting is one very big area of applications of nanoparticles. So conceptually, what does that look like? Say, for example, we have these disease cells or cancer cells in the center surrounded by normal cells. By administering these Prussian blue nanoparticles and other nanoparticles, we have the ability to very precisely paint these cells at an individual level. So for other considerations to be kept in mind is that these nanoparticles should be non-toxic, and I talked about a little bit about it before. They need to be stable for the time period that they're doing what they're supposed to do. They also should be capable of targeting. You should be able to inject these particles and they be able to bind with high fidelity to the diseased uh, area and not to normal tissue, and that requires some uh, engineering and scientific optimization. So we've done studies determining what is safe with our Prussian blue nanoparticles, how to make them biocompatible, how to attach targeting groups to effect uh, imaging applications. So here is an, ex uh, an example of how we're using Prussian blue nanoparticles to paint cells, disease cells, on an individual cell level. So this multi-panel figure on the first row you have normal tissue or normal cells. On the second row, you have disease cells. In the first column, before the nanoparticles, you cannot see any difference between the two types of cells. And in this case, you do see a morphological difference, but many times you're not able to see it. After administering the nanoparticles, you are able to paint these disease cells green so that now, if you're trying to do a surgical procedure, you can say, yes, this is where the disease is and is localized and now I can plan a therapy or a surgical procedure, and so on. Another example is in the use of, uh, in diagnosing and imaging uh, pediatric brain tumors. This is where we've used the technology. 
Now, Elizabeth has done some great work in brain penetrating nanoparticles, and I'll allow her to speak a little bit about this particular field. But just suffice to say that in these applications, you know, on the left panel, you have a, a, an animal with a brain tumor, but you don't see anything. After administering these nanoparticles, they home in very precisely in the region of the brain tumor, so you're able to visualize it. So if you want to plan an operation on the brain tumor, you can do it in a more precise manner. How are we using our Prussian blue nanoparticles for therapy? Well, Prussian blue absorbs red light and heats up. A common example of this is if you have a car with black leather seats, it heats up much more in the sunlight than a car with white leather seats. So the same optical properties, a similar optical properties, Prussian blue nanoparticles exhibit, where they absorb red light and they heat up. So you're going to be wondering, what in the world has this got to do with human health? It turns out that red light penetrates deeper through human tissue. And to illustrate this example, I take my flashlight from my phone, and it's white. If I place my finger over it, you'll see that it appears red. So many of you have done this demo as kids, and it's not because you know, your blood is red. It's because red light penetrates deeper through human tissue. So if you precisely are able to target the Prussian blue nanoparticles or inject them in a cancer cell, uh, in a cancer tumor, this and, and irradiate it with a low-power laser, the red light will penetrate and pass through the normal tissue. It'll encounter the nanoparticles inside the cells, it'll heat up and it'll burn and destroy the cancer. So this cartoon schematically describes that. The nanoparticles are injected, they heat up under irradiation, and they burn the cancer cells. So this panel shows you how we have used our nanoparticles to affect this therapy. On the left panel is what you would see when you do a biopsy. You know, when you have, there's a, there's a suspicion that you may have cancer, it goes out to pathology, and this is what they'll see. Many cells, all these purple uh, dots represent the many cells of the cancer. And after you've burnt the cancer, along the progression of removing the cancer from the body, you'll see a reduction in the number of cells. And then eventually, when you're completely treated, you should just see a blank screen there. So you've probably heard of immunotherapy, and some of the most fascinating work that we've been, and results that we've been getting has been using nanotechnology in combination with immunotherapy. So you'll be wondering, what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is using the human body's own immune system and its clearance mechanisms in combination with nanotechnology to treat complex diseases like metastatic cancer, cancer that is in, in its advanced stages. And in preclinical animal models, we've got some very exciting data where we've seen that a tumor, as exhibited here by a rainbow color, goes away completely by our combination therapy treatment. And some exciting facts about this is, albeit these are already in animal studies, so the survival of animals that are untreated, you have all animals succumb to the disease of this, this particular type of cancer. But when you use the state-of-the-art immunotherapy by itself, about one in eight of these animals survive. But if we use our combination therapy, we are able to cure completely more than half of the animals that are treated with our combination therapy. So this is very exciting. And we're going to try and take this technology further to the clinic. So this has implications for treating metastatic cancer. And the cool aspect of this is that by using this technology, you can confer immunity. So a lot of you have heard about vaccines in, uh, over the past couple of days. By using these combination uh, therapies, you are able to create like a vaccination effect such that once you have taken the, the body and you've gotten rid of the cancer, the, the therapy confers an immunity so that if there's any recurrence, the body remembers the, you know, re remembers that these are cancer cells, attacks it, and prevents recurrence of the, the disease from coming back. And so this is very exciting. So I'd like to conclude this part of the, the tutorial by 
giving you some outlook. So many of you have seen the movie Fantastic Voyage, which was released in the 60s that talks about this high-value person that was saved by this brain surgery by shrinking people that go and you know, uh, swim through the bloodstream and they go to the brain and they do this complex surgery. And I'm happy to note that many of these modules that have made this fiction you know, something that was so far out there, we are very much making strides along this using nanotechnology to make this fiction a fact. And so by using the imaging capabilities of nanoparticles, the therapeutic capabilities of nanoparticles, we're confident that in maybe the next two or three decades, we can do a fantastic voyage in treating cancers and other diseases in patients. And so hopefully that gives you a flavor of the capabilities of what we can do with nanotechnology. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Jim. Come on. That was great. Okay. And now I'm going to turn it over to, to Elizabeth Nance. Elizabeth is an assistant professor of uh, clinical engineering and radiology at the University of Washington, transitioning there from Hopkins, where she's been for a while now. She finished her PhD in, in 2012 and uh, then did a fellowship in, in critical care medicine and anesthesia. So uh, tell us a little bit about your work and add on to what Rowan said. Sure. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Um, so I will qualify this by saying I am a chemical engineer, which usually in the field means we know like absolutely nothing. That's kind of our starting point. Um, we're really good at making a lot of educated guesses. Um, so this, I'll give you a little bit of perspective on how I got into nanotechnology, where I think the importance of nanotechnology can uh, be in medicine, and why it even became a factor in medicine in the first place. So nanotechnology sort of came on the radar of medicine in around the 1970s. Um, the main reason, I think Rowan touched upon this a little bit, um, and I'll try and broaden it um, and expand upon it, is because there was a large delivery challenge in medicine. So if you think about cancer, um, you're giving a cocktail of chemotherapeutic drugs to try and treat a patient. There is nothing about that drug that is gonna tell it to go specifically to the cancer. So there was no way to say that when we put a drug into the body that it's gonna go where we need it to get to. And there were a lot of good drugs out there. They worked exceptionally well in preclinical studies and in vitro cell culture type studies and animal models. But when you put them into humans, they didn't have the ability to get to where they needed to go. So in engineering, it's a great opportunity. You come in, you look at something, you have a technical problem. It's largely a delivery problem. Can we potentially come in and play a role and design a platform that might allow us to get something to the site of interest where we need it to actually get to, and by default, not get it everywhere else? So there were a couple particle platforms, and Rowan mentioned a few. Um, he mentioned the um, Prussian Blue particle platform that he's working on. There's been about 13 other particle platforms that have actually made it into commercial use. None of those up until this time have actually been part of standard of care. Those particle platforms, some of you might have heard of, they're things like a Braxane, which is a taxol loaded um, polymer system. Polymers are just long repeating units of carbon, nitrogen, um, oxygen. They can often be broken down in the body or cleared out from the body. There was also <laughs> particle systems like liposomes. So doxel was another example, which is a doxorubicin loaded liposome. Liposomes are sort of these spherical particles. They're made up of fatty acids, the same thing that your cell membranes in your body are made up of. So they're nice because they basically are made of the same components of what's already in your body. So they're very compatible. Now these particle platforms were all used mostly in cancer applications. And unfortunately, as many of you know, Cancer is a very low-hanging fruit application for new technologies because there's just not much out there that works very well. So for new and especially novel drug delivery technologies, nanotechnology was an exceptional way, cancer was an exceptional way for nanotechnology to kind of come into the field of medicine. So most of these particle platforms initially were for things like pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, metastatic breast cancer, and they've been used clinically since about 1990. Um, but again, not part of the traditional standard of care. This is the first thing we go to when we're thinking of treating patients. There have been a few other platforms that have come around in the past 10 years. Some have been in gel formation, so like a topical treatment. Um, these were actually for vaginal administrations for treating STDs and HIV, where you apply a topical gel. They had nanoparticles loaded into the gel that had a drug, and those nanoparticles would go and have this antimicrobial, antibacterial effect. There's also particle systems that touch upon some of what Rohan's done, um, which are imaging agents. So there's iron oxide nanoparticles. These are small metallic particles. They have a contrast that's inherent 
uh, contrastability that's inherent to the particle system itself. So when you excite them, they emit something back to you so that you can see them. These particle systems have been used for imaging cancer type platforms for our cancer type, uh, or cancers in general for the past 10 years or so. However, again, none of these have actually been considered a standard part of care. And I think Rohan touched upon this a little bit. It's because it's a very complicated system. We're working at a very small scale. So when you think about, I like to think about um, comparing a soccer ball to the size of the Earth. Think of that scale difference. Now take that scale difference and think of a nanoparticle compared to a soccer ball. You're looking at the same size difference. A nanoparticle, soccer ball, soccer ball, Earth. You're talking about the same size difference between the soccer ball and each end of the spectrum. Now those particle systems, even though they're tiny, are extremely powerful because in medicine, the one thing they were capable of doing was protecting a drug from going everywhere in the body and from getting cleared out before it had a chance to get to the site of interest and have an effect. So your body is exceptional at getting rid of anything that you put into it. It's very good at clearing out any foreign objects. So that would apply to any drug that you put in. The drug is gonna come into contact with whatever it runs into first. It's either gonna get sucked up by whatever it ran into, or it's gonna get broken down. So you need to be able to protect it. So nanotechnology provided this very small way to protect the, and load into a very a, a small space, load in this drug and protect this drug from getting cleared out of your body and then being, allowing it to have more opportunity to get to the site of interest. So it was a very powerful tool uh, but one that was not very well understood. And one of the challenges, I think, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in, uh, later on in the discussion, is that we're working oftentimes in very, very complex disease settings. So you think about, uh, this is an area close to mine and Rowan, Rowan's heart, you think about brain disease. Okay, brain disease accounts right now for about 13% of our global burden of disease. That's a huge amount. We spend about $700 billion each year trying to treat a variety of brain diseases. This includes everything from Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, stroke, autism, schizophrenia, tumors. You're talking about a massive list of diseases that we currently have no effective cure for. Now, when you look at drugs that have been attempted to be delivered to the brain, there's about 7,600 drugs that the, Central, uh, the Center for Disease, Disease Control has approved as effective for brain delivery. Only about 4% of those have ever actually even been able to get to the brain, much less do anything when it's there. So we have this massive disease burden, we have this huge challenge of treating these diseases, and we have this need to more effectively deliver a drug to the site of interest. So nanotechnology is an area that Rowan and I have pursued in treating brain diseases because we have this opportunity to use these very small systems to facilitate delivery into a very challenging organ. And some of the ways we've done that are by taking advantage of biology and the way that biology allows us to get something into a site of interest. So for instance, Rowan talked about cancer. Cancer is a fascinating biological specimen. If you sort of step back and look at it objectively, um, it causes a lot of devastation, but it's fascinating as a biological specimen. When cancers grow, they take over your blood supply. When they take over your blood supply, they do this extremely sloppily. They're not very good at reorganizing and building blood vessels that actually are gonna sustain their blood flow to the tumor. So they create very leaky blood vessels. And those leaky blood vessels now give you basically an access point to that tumor to get a particle platform into. So there's aspects of biology that you can take advantage of with these technologies to better to deliver a therapeutic. But once you get these particles to the tumor, you need to actually be able to have them have an effect, right? You need it to only influence the tumor cells and not anything else surrounding it. And so that's where engineering based on specific molecular targets or having a drug that is only going to work on tumor cells or only excites in the presence of tumor cells um, can be very effective. And those drugs are things that you can protect and load into this nanotechnology platform so that you can only get it to these sites of interest. Now, one of the areas I think that Rowan touched upon this that I've been very interested in has been outside of cancer, um, which has been in areas like cerebral palsy and autism and newborn stroke, um, which are lifetime developmental disorders. Uh, they have a high mortality, so a high death rate associated with them. Oftentimes, people that are taking care of kids with these diseases usually have about a lifetime cost somewhere between one and three billion dollars, three million dollars, sorry. Um, and there's really no effective cure. But they don't necessarily offer the same opportunities to access them that you would see in like a cancer, for instance. They don't necessarily have these leaky blood vessels that give you an access point to get something very small 
into. So there's ways that I've been interested in sort of taking advantage of the way we can engineer these particle platforms at a small scale, change their properties, and by properties we're talking about things like size, surface charge, so whether it's positively or negatively charged, the actual composition of the particle platform. So there's Prussian blue, there's those liposomal particles I mentioned before, there's iron oxide nanoparticles, there's polymeric systems that can break down. So changing that composition to try and better understand what is limiting our ability to get something to the brain in some of these long-term developmental disorders where biology doesn't necessarily give us an access point, and what are the potential targets that we can, we can access once we get it to the brain that might then give us an effect. Um, and I think that's been, it's a new area. It's, as Rowan said, this is probably in cancer even 20 to 30 years from application, um, from standard you know, daily use application. But in developmental disorders or things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, other diseases where we don't really understand extensively well from the biology side, there's potential, but I think it's still possibly a, a long way off. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and then be happy to right. elaborate on any other points. Thanks so much. <laughs> Elizabeth, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about, so you, you developed nanoparticles that can cross the blood-brain barrier. That's right. a, don't be modest, that's a <laughs> big accomplishment. I mean, um, and I think that's a great example of how, of a complex system of the body trying to prevent these things from right. getting in. Absolutely. I mean, how did you approach that problem and why after, you know, been working on within nanoparticles for, for decades and no one else has done this, so how did you figure it out? Ah, <laughs> that's a great question. So, um, so I, first, I think most people, it's probably helpful uh, just to frame this in the context of the brain. The blood-brain barrier, for those of you that haven't heard about it, um, is basically this highly regulated protective barrier between your blood vessels and the brain tissue. And it's considered to be one of the most regulated barriers in the body. Um, it's made up of cells that surround your blood vessels, and those cells and the proteins between these cells are highly regulated by other cells within the brain, by things like blood flow, your breathing rate, your metabolism. And you want that to be the case. You want this to be highly regulated. You don't want just anything getting into the brain. So that's good for normal day-to-day -day functioning, but very bad if you need to get a drug in to actually have an effect. Uh, the benefit, I think, and something that hadn't really been thoroughly studied is the fact that the blood-brain barrier in many diseases is often impaired. Um, but the extent of impairment varies from person to person, disease to disease, the way the disease started, how it progresses. And that hadn't been well studied. And it hadn't been well studied because there wasn't really enough of an understanding of how things move within the body um, and how they move within the brain. And so it seems like a fairly simple um, simple concept, but when you put something into your body, you want it to be able to move as readily as possible until you don't need it to move anymore, right? You want it to move until it gets to the site of interest. Well, in the brain, there have been clinical trials for 50, 60 years with different technologies trying to get things to get to the brain and then move, and none of them had. And the main reason is because your brain is very effective at making sure this blood-brain barrier is working well enough to not allow things through. But even once you get it across, there's all this junk. And I know I probably offend most neuroscientists when I call that junk. But there's a lot of junk in the brain. There's cells, there's proteins, there's blood vessels. You've got to move through all this junk if you want to get to your side of interest. And so one of the things we started looking at, and this was purely from an engineering approach, was what governs movement, what doesn't govern movement, what properties of a particle system, which for us were scalable to proteins, small molecule drugs, what properties of that system, like size and surface charge and composition and molecular weight, were going to govern the ability of something to not only cross that blood-brain barrier, but then be able to move and distribute within the brain. And so we were able to do that actually with a couple particle platforms because we found some very fundamental principles. We like to take, I always make fun of chemical engineers, but that's because I am one, so I feel like I can. We like to take like sort of the simplest way possible. Um, so one of the things that I've been really interested in is finding what's common. What can we take advantage of that is common amongst many diseases? And movement in the brain in every sort of, every sort of brain disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, tumors, whatever you're talking about, is necessary to be able to reach the multiple regions you need a drug to get to to actually have an effect. And so we started looking just broadly what governs movement in the brain. And if we can understand what governs movement from the brain, can we then, being the typical engineers, control it? And if we can control it, then can we have a profound effect? And we've been able to do that in a couple tumors, 
cerebral palsy, um, and a neonatal stroke model is sort of the areas that we've been able to show that if we can improve movement alone, solely the ability to move within the brain better, that we can actually improve therapeutic outcomes. So we can have the, most of these are in animal models, we can have the animals live longer, we can have them behave more normally, um, we don't have any of these off-site side effects because the drugs are only getting where they need to go, but they're able to readily move and get to those regions of interest. So you're both very realistic about the time frame for, this, for things being rolled out into everyday clinical use, and it's long. Um, so in the world of research where funding is tough to come by, where there's competition for immediately useful products and procedures. How is, is there a lot of interest in continued work in nanotechnology? Are you feeling squeezed for time? Do you feel like it's a, it's a receptive, creative environment to, to do the work that you feel needs to be done and then to convey it to the public in a way that's, you know, we're constantly interested in the newest, best thing and what, what can I get next week? And, and if we're talking about decades from now, how do we you know, keep people interested and keep them up to date on the latest without over-promising, over-hyping, uh, which media tends to do, including me. Yeah. So I think creating supportive environments for scientists and investigators to work is one of the most important things. Uh, you know, you need to have access to resources, funding. You need to have access to teams because we don't work in individual silos. In the pipeline of development of a new drug, you first start with doing things on the bench, uh, then you move to animal testing, then you start clinical trials, then you go to late clinical trials, you apply for FDA approval, then it goes to market, and, that, and then after that it becomes like a standard of care. So you'll appreciate that this takes a really long time. So this requires investment, this requires support, in terms of like getting resources, having a supportive environment. And the good thing is that there are pockets of that happening. For example, uh, Elizabeth and I are in institutions that put us in good close proximity to the people that will be using our technology. So if I'm developing a new cancer therapeutic, I need to be able to vet my idea with people who would be applying that therapy to patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the ability to sit down with them and troubleshoot and understand you know, what exactly we can do to better develop these therapies, it puts us in a good position to actually move these technologies further over the next few years. So if I'm a practicing emergency physician or radiologist and you came to me, I could say, no, that's crazy. We would never use that. It's that's not, very helpful. Not practical. <laughs> Start over. To be told crazy <laughs> is a good thing. It, it's, it's a good thing, actually, yeah. because the medical uh, field is very conservative for good reason. The first time you, with, you go with, an, with a crazy idea, like as engineers like to do, they're going to say, this is crazy, which it is. And so it forces you to frame your idea in a way that makes it more tangible for them to understand how they can apply it to patients. So one of two things can happen. Either they can, complete dis can completely dismiss your idea, and you go back to the drawing board and improve your design, and that process of iteration makes your product a lot stronger. Or they give you a supportive upfront tell you, like, this is great, and so what is it we need to do to move this process forward? So that kind of interaction being able to have that, and that's only been recently recognized uh, in the field. Primarily, that if previously in the past five to ten years is when this recognition has come about. A few decades ago, you know, you would be working in your own individual lab, you would be doing academic research. There are probably a lot of good ideas and therapies and you know, systems out there that probably never reach the market because they don't have this kind of a supportive environment or the investment to take it all the way through. So these are some of the challenges our field faces. And you know, I'm happy to note that there are pockets of that where these problems are recognized and they're being addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just I'll echo that you know, the physicians make great reality checks, too, when you're an engineer. Um, and you've got a great idea, and you think this could solve all their problems. And you go in there like, there's no way we're going to be able to apply that in the clinic. And that is a relatively new, I think, phenomena of having that sort of close interaction and conversation. And I would even go farther in saying that nanotechnology 
has the opportunity to drive this even more because it's a field at the interfaces. So like some of the personalized medicine um, that you've heard about and vaccines um, that you've heard about in other sessions, nanotechnology is not based on just a single field. You have engineers, material scientists, chemists, biologists, clinicians um, that are all gonna have to play a role in actually coming together and helping connect the great abundance of information that exists between all these fields right now in a way that is then clinically relevant and practical that addresses some of the problems that exist um, in treating patients with disease uh, that, that we have on, face on a daily basis right now. And, you know, I, you know, I guess, I, so I'm at Hopkins right now. I'm transitioning to the University of Washington um, in a faculty position. Just went through this interview process with chemical engineering and biomedical engineering fields. Um, and there's still, you know, a strong, I guess, a strong presence of thinking that it's best to stay on your field, stay in your field with your expertise, and sort of just reach out when you need help. Um, and I think Rowan and I have really been lucky and fortunate enough and, and worked our way into the point where we can actually exist. You know, we've got affiliated appointments in radiology and pediatrics and neurology and neurosurgery uh, as engineers where we can actually coexist amongst all these fields to help continue driving this technology as a way to better connect all of this abundance of information that we're gathering from the basic science and the clinical side to actually practically find a way to implement it, um, and it for people to help people. Um, so I think it'll actually just keep growing. I do think, though, that if we're not cautious about how we connect this information, that it puts us at risk for losing faith um, from the clinicians and from the public. So it's something that you'll find we're, you know, fairly, we will be understated about a lot of what we say, but it, there's a great risk of overpromising, especially when you're working with people who are trying to treat patients with disease. And when you overpromise and you create false hope, you don't then want to go 10 years, put all this money and time and effort into it, and not have a product that at the end actually works. Um, and so I think that there's a great responsibility of fields like nanotechnology as well um, to be careful and cautious, even if we're doing what would seem higher risk stuff by taking a nanoparticle, putting it in a person, and saying this is going to tell us everything about the disease. We still have to you know, keep it in perspective and say this is actually the information we're going to get. This is how it can be useful. And we're doing this all in the context of the clinical mind, so it's still practical. You mentioned public, public opinion, pe the potential of people losing faith. I mean, do you feel like that's happening? Is that your sense uh, that the public interest has been uh, maybe in the 90s or the last decade was really strong and now it's less, or is it still growing, still something people don't know about? So I think it depends on what perspective you look at it from. If you look from the commercial investment side, that's just rapidly increased over the past 10 years. Um, I think I'm probably overly cautious about it. Um, so maybe I'm just you know, not trying to be an alarmist, but being on one extreme side. Um, but I think that there is, there is you, nanotechnology has been used in medicine since the 70s. We don't have anything that has really found a stronghold. Um, why that is could be multifactorial. There could be maybe just lack of understanding the biology, not well, good enough understanding of the materials we were using, not good enough understanding of human anatomy and physiology. There could be a, a whole host of factors. Um, but, you know, it's been out there. And if there's the general sense that, well, we've invested 40 years in this and we haven't quite seen anything yet, even though it does take about 20 years to get something in the clinical application, then you know why would we keep investing in it? And so I think we just have to be very aware of that and also um, make sure we're asking the right questions. I would say that's sort of what I see my role you know, being in science and, and supervising students and training people is you always need to be asking the right questions. Are these questions relevant to the patient? Are they actually gonna make a difference in outcome? Um, and if we do that, I think it helps keep us focused and keep pursuing in a way that's <coughs> that's actually gonna drive us more to public, um, broad, widespread public use and health. I'd like to piggyback on that. With any new field or area of interest, there's this huge spike in interest in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And when, then, when things don't pan out, there's a huge like, bust <laughs> or a drop. Yeah. And then there's a gradual recovery uh, after, after a while. So nanomedicine and nanotechnology has gone through that peak you know, interest and that big crash. And I'm happy to say that we are on the recovery phase yeah. uh, and a strong recovery. It is based on sound science, team science, keeping in mind what needs to be done to get better outcomes for the patients rather than overselling ideas and overstating ideas. And I think that fundamental change in how we conduct science in this field has been now brought into place and practice. And I'm 
So that keeps me very encouraged of the fact that in 5, 10, 15 years, you are going to see things that become you know, clinical standard of care using nanomedicine. And hopefully, some of our technologies, maybe in 15 or 20 years, we'd be back at this festival telling okay. you that you know, we'd, we've solved this problem yeah. or found a cure for this particular pediatric cancer or neurological disease. So I'm very optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's set a date. Let's do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'd like to open it up for some audience questions for our, for our scientists. And uh, first hand, at, well, whoever, there are two people coming around with the microphone, so we'll go there. Thank you for a great discussion and for your amazing cutting edge work. Could you, for a lay audience, or mostly lay, I don't want to speak on everyone's behalf, expand a bit further about how the um, particle platforms excite only in the presence of either disease tissue or tumors or what it is you're trying to target? So. This has to be contextualized, so let's talk about Prussian blue nanoparticles. Uh, it basically has this intrinsic property that it absorbs red light and heats up. So if you are able to precisely direct these nanoparticles to a cancer using some of the, the mechanisms of the body, which uh, Elizabeth talked about, where cancer cells take up things more because they're more hungry or greedy, then these nanoparticles, even though they're systemically injected, would then accumulate inside a cancer. And so when you would shine a laser light, I showed you how it penetrates to normal tissue, and it would then encounter the nanoparticles in the cancer cell and heat up and create a, a destructive effect of, you know, of damaging and destroying the tumor. Um, the nanoparticles go everywhere, but you're just shining a light at On a focused area of interest. So even though the nanoparticles could go everywhere, and, you know, and it could be dis biodistributed everywhere, you're not really concerned about where it goes because you've tried, presumably you've already addressed the toxicity problem. So even though they've gone to different places, they're getting degraded there in a safe manner. But you focus your, uh, your at attention to the area of interest, which is a cancer, which previously you will have imaged using MRI, CT, and say, okay, this is the precise area I need to focus, and I'm going to shine my light only here, I'm going to destroy the cancer in a very focused and targeted manner, in a precise manner. So I'll just elaborate a little bit. I think one of the, um, it is very platform dependent, so material dependent on where they go and how they get there. Um, but there's things that like biology naturally has. So cancers are often very acidic at their core. Um, so as they grow, the, the middle of the tumor becomes more acidic. And so there's ways you can design chemistry to basically a, a release a drug from a particle platform in an acidic environment. So once it hits a certain pH, the drug can come off. There's definitely cells in the brain, for instance, that are your, that basically are like immune cells in the brain in the presence of disease. These guys become extremely angry. They tend to gobble up a lot more stuff, but also inside of them, they have the overproduction of an enzyme that specifically can cleave, if you design the right chemistry, can specifically cut off the drug only once that particle platform gets inside the cell. So there's definitely ways that you can take advantage of chemistry and of the material itself to make sure that it's specific only at your site of interest. But as Rowan said, it is very contextual, it is very material dependent and very disease dependent. Go right here. Great, thank you so much for that talk. My name is Ray, I'm a radiologist. So my question is, you say you pass through your ideas by consulting physicians, and yet physicians are notoriously risk averse and uncreative. How, what do you do if they're wrong? That's my first question. My second one is, could you elaborate? Anytime you talk about a new drug, you have to talk about side effects. What are the known and potential complications or side effects of your nanoparticles? And so I work for a physician right now as, actually, as part of my training. Um, I found that they're very excitable, but also very risk averse. Um, so it's a good and a bad thing. Um, I, think, I think it's very, you know, it's very important. Um, and this is something I just find very, I found very important in my um, training. I worked a lot with neurosurgery while I was doing my PhD and radiation oncology and radiology. And I think it was really important to tailor the language and use the appropriate language to the clinician, but do so in a very conserved way. So don't oversell something. State that this is what you think it does in the right context, and then, um, and then say what the potential applications are. For me, one of the ways to sort of counter um, so the concerns of medicine, I've had the opportunity and luxury to test particle platforms in multiple models 
multiple different animal models, which I think is important, of the same disease. Um, and I think that helps validate sort of the ability to then get it into a person. Um, I think also when you're looking at things like common factors of diseases that you can take advantage of, it sort of lowers the, you know, gives you some lower hanging fruit um, that you can pursue that'll allow you to maybe more readily translate from what is very controlled environments at the bench to very uncontrolled environments in the clinic. Um, but I think it's an ongoing conversation with setting realistic expectations and showing that you can validate this in as many ways as possible that'll satisfy whatever the field sees fit to, or needs to have satisfaction for, so. So as a, as a total layperson, what I'm trying to understand from you is what this actually is, and it so sounds like it's a, it's a targeted drug delivery system. So that leads me to two questions. First, is there any limit to the kinds of drugs that could be delivered by the system? And the second question is, is there any kind of uh, common way to create this drug delivery system so that it's actually, I'm from Silicon Valley, like the internet, where you could where drug developers could deliver, could create drugs to be delivered by this common carrier system without the involvement of researchers, for example? Uh, th that's a fabulous question. So a good way to think about this is that, you know, you're trying to develop a tailorable platform. So nanotechnology is, is a family of like different functionalities, if you will. So you can bring all these together in a mix and match way. The problem is many of us go about solving a specific problem. So that requires you to tailor more for say, for example, if you're trying to do diagnosis, you would skew your design towards more of imaging, uh, you know, so, so that you can more precisely image the disease. If you're trying to do delivery of a drug in a very precise manner, you would skew your design to make a more precise drug delivery uh, you know, formulation. But in principle, what the best way to go about it is to put all these functionalities together and to create like what is known as a, like a toolkit so that you can mix and match and tailor it in a personalizable way for different diseases. And I see the field moving in that particular way. I, I already mentioned to you the reason why we haven't done it is because most of us have worked in our individual academic scientific bins. But as with more of open access you know, research, Previously, when you publish your research, you would pay a fee for it to be published, or if you want to access, read a particular journal, you would have to pay high premium to just see what is being published. But with this greater emphasis on open access, you know, this knowledge goes out into the public space, so that you've, what you've created is a toolbox that you can mix and match, and you would not need us anymore at that point. <laughs> My name is Joe, and I'm a neurologist at Cornell in New York City. And that was a really great talk, and, and like most physicians, I am very excitable, so I'm very excited right now. I'm also extremely risk-averse, and especially, you know, uh, uh, as a neurologist, dealing with the brain, and I, and I applaud you for taking that on because, my God, of all the areas in the body to try to tackle, the brain is clearly the most complicated. And the reality is that, you know, we can, de we can develop a delivery mechanism to get somewhere, but we don't speak the language of where that thing goes. And I think that's the ultimate problem. The, the, to me, the major problem with most neurologic diseases, especially neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, and ALS, are that we don't even know what's going on. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know what the problem is. We don't know what the inciting event is. And so we don't really have any therapeutics that we could deliver in any rational way other than just looking at the thousands of things that are already out there. And I think that's the ultimate problem. And so that's, I think, why we're 20 to 50 years away from really treating things like neurodegenerative disease, which the reality is only 2% of graduating US medical students even go into neurology, yeah. let alone um, you know, uh, uh, research in these areas. It's a big problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't envy you at all for having, to treat, <laughs> for having to tackle that problem from a clinical perspective. Um, I will say that I think uh, like the approach I'm taking, and I've completely made up this term, um, is what I would deem like a disease-directed engineering approach. Um, and I think the goal of this approach, um, which I'm building my lab around, is that we use nanotechnology as a way to probe a disease. Tell us what about the disease is present that will dictate or change a therapeutic outcome. And then maybe also, um, and this, I've got one platform that does this, um, 
tell us what cells are involved in disease, what aspects of the brain are involved in disease, something that we can't really pin down well with current imaging modalities. We can do this very well in animal models right now because you can do imaging in animal models that obviously don't translate to humans but give you very nice quantitative data. Um, but I think it helps us get a better understanding by taking this approach. If you're probing the disease first, asking just sort of broadly, what's going on in this context and is this going to impact my therapeutic outcome? And then you gather that information, use that information to sort of direct how you would engineer, whether that's, as Rowan mentioned earlier, to a diagnostic or a therapeutic or maybe some combination of both platform, then you can potentially ease or lower the sort of time it takes and the complexity of the particle system that it, you might have to engineer otherwise that could allow it to get more quickly into clinic, at least into clinical testing. Um, so I, I, at least that's been my way to sort of tackle that problem, um, and I am, I agree, it's, it's a very challenging way to do it, but I think if we can find ways to sort of simplify our approaches um, and our engineering without understating how complex these diseases are, it'll help us um, in being able to more readily translate from the bench to the bedside. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I'm a transplant cardiologist at Mayo. Uh, my question is about brain targeting, actually. And the thing I'm trying to understand is if you have these nanoparticles that can go through the vascular endothelium and the vascular niche and you're giving them IV, how do you actually get them to get to the brain and cross that blood vessel barrier versus any other? And then the second question I have is why not use the CSF? Ah, so, yeah, that's a great question. So there are... Um, cerebral spinal fluid. Yeah, so cerebral spinal <laughs> fluid is, is um, what he was referring to. So I think systemic delivery is always sort of the end goal, so directly into the bloodstream, I think is always the end goal for, like, technologies like this because, um, because in theory, that would be one of the easiest ways to regularly give patients um, a treatment. However, in, like, nurse, you know, neurosurgery, there's still options to do administrations into cerebral spinal fluid directly into the brain when the surgeon's already in, or even like intranasally, um, which is another sort of growing technique. Um, in the context of getting it across specifically the blood-brain barrier, not anywhere else, I would again go back to the question earlier. It's very material-based. Um, so for instance, I work with a Dendrimer platform. These things are like very tiny. They're on the order of four nanometers. They're about 100 times, no, sorry, 10 times smaller than the particle platform that um, Rowan works with. And they're sort of tree-like branched particles. Um, these can go through an impaired blood-brain barrier, which is present in most diseases, even though the extent of impairment is very variable. However, a larger particle platform, like a polymeric system, which breaks down in the body, does not go through. Um, so it is very material dependent that these particle systems access only the point you want to get them to, and I think that just requires, requires testing. And it's not to say, I should qualify this, it's not to say they don't get everywhere else, it's to say that they don't stay everywhere else. Um, so they might get into other organs, but then walk back out, yeah. So I'd like to add to that a little bit because there's this whole field of neurointerventional radiology where people are able to snake catheters from your thigh mm -hmm. right up to the basilar artery in your brain. And so even if, you, and, and it, this is done routinely and in a very safe manner. And so even if you have the problem of an intact blood-brain barrier, these people are experts at being able to very transiently and at, in a, at a, a short periods of time open the blood-brain barrier using small chemicals or molecules. And if you can infuse that very locally with your nanoparticles, then that is some way how you can use these mechanisms or methodologies that some other field has developed so perfectly to get our nanoparticles into the brain. So this brings me back to that previous thing about team science, the concept of team science, is that I would not know this unless I had an appointment in the field of, you know, in a department of radiology. So now that I know that this is possible, we can test these modalities out in combination with what uh, I make so that even though it may be bigger than a dendrimer, you are still able to get it to where it needs to go using these methodologies. I feel like that's a closing thought for <laughs> almost every session. Collaboration is the answer. Right. Thank you so much to uh, Ron and Elizabeth. Thank you for coming. <laughs>